The Avengers. That's what we call ourselves. Sort of like a team. Earth's mightiest heroes type thing. Avengers, time to work for a living. That's my secret. I'm always angry. I am on the side of life. You get hurt, hurt them back. You get killed, walk it off. I'm here to talk to you about the Avenger Initiative. I'm your host, Andrew, and I'm here to talk to you about the Avengers. Welcome to episode 80 of Some Assembly Required, your podcast adventure into the annals of Earth's mightiest heroes, the Avengers. This week, we are taking a look at Avengers number 75, The Warlord and the Witch. This week's issue is written by Roy Thomas, pencils by John Buscema, inks by Tom Palmer, letters by Sam Rosen, and it comes to us in April of 1970. Starting off with our cover, this cover gives us a pretty solid indication of several things that are going to happen within the issue. The return of Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch are the most obvious, but somewhat less obvious is the fact that two of the Avengers, specifically Wasp and Yellowjacket, will be leaving the team, at least for a little while. One other thing the cover does for us, though, is it gives an incorrect impression that Quicksilver will be returning to his villainous ways by destroying Earth, which in reality is not the case, as we'll see throughout the issue. Getting to the meat of the issue here, starting with a wonderful splash page, we see Panic racing through the heart of Jarvis, butler and caretaker of Avengers Mansion, as an alarm has been tripped indicating there is an intruder in the headquarters aircraft section. To Jarvis's shock and concern, the invader seems to be hurtling past all of the mansion's defenses at an unimaginable speed before quickly arriving in front of the astonished servant. Of course, the culprit is none other than the mutant speedster and former Avenger Quicksilver, and he is demanding to know where the Avengers are. Jarvis then informs Quicksilver that they are away from the mansion at the moment at Pier 12, and Quicksilver begins to take a breather from his long journey, but as soon as Jarvis Jarvis mentions Quicksilver's sister, Scarlet Witch, he immediately springs back into action and is away. So it's been a while since we've seen a really, really great opening splash page. I love the detail that is given to Jarvis, especially in his facial expression, where he's showing, as I said, shock and concern. He's caught unaware of what's going on and is trying to respond as best he can. So they do a really good job of showing his expression. And I love the inking detail on his clothing. It's just giving the character a lot of depth. I do wish John Buscema had worked the title into the actual panel like we've seen him do in the past, as opposed to where it's placed right now, which really takes up about a quarter of the page. And there is a lot of wasted kind of white space on this page that could have been used to further enhance the already excellent art. Now, obviously, as I mentioned, to start with, Jarvis doesn't really know what he's paired up against. But given the art effect that's used, and when it's paired with the information that the reader would get from the cover, it's pretty clear to us, the reader, that the blur is Quicksilver. Now, it isn't immediately obvious, though, what Quicksilver's presence portends, because last time we saw him in Avengers, although he was fleeing Magneto, it was really in a questionable state. He and Scarlet Witch had joined Magneto. Quicksilver was really struggling with the general anti-mutant sentiment of the public, so it's hard to say where his motives really lie at the moment. Now, for those who had read further into the Marvel Universe, specifically Spider-Man number 71, which is mentioned as an editor's note, Jarvis and Quicksilver had a earlier run in in a very similar manner where Quicksilver shows up looking for the Avengers and the Avengers aren't home. Now, in that case, Quicksilver is looking to talk to the Avengers and explain his actions since having left Magneto and basically start trying to prove that he isn't a villain. As a result of this intention, he gets a little wrapped up in a Spider-Man plot where Spider-Man is framed for some things he didn't do, and Quicksilver decides to try and bring in Spider-Man as a demonstration of his good intentions. But for anyone not having read Spider-Man 71, Quicksilver's appearance here does come with a little bit of mystery. Now, once we establish what Quicksilver is here for, at least in the most basic sense, I do have some mixed feelings about Quicksilver really 
really taking that moment and slowing down while he's talking with Jarvis. On one hand, it's pretty obvious he is almost totally exhausted and it's having an effect on his mental state. On the other hand, Quicksilver is very clearly at the mansion with a singular purpose and the fact that he forgets that purpose so close to completing it is a little bit difficult to wrap my head around he's very focused on one thing and then as soon as he gets within arm's reach of that thing he forgets it for a couple of minutes that, that's a, that's a little odd to me so from here we cut to Pier 12, where the Avengers are seeing off their teammates Yellow Jacket and Wasp, along with Bill Foster. And this is because Yellow Jacket has accepted a government research position in Alaska, and so the trio is preparing to set sail for Alaska. Once again, we see Hank and Janet here trying to have a normal-ish life, or at least as much of a normal life as one can have working as a superhero biochemist in Alaska on a government project, because nothing bad ever comes from things like that. As the vessel departs, the remaining Avengers notice that there's a strong breeze suddenly sweeping through the area, and Captain America rightly determines that the breeze is no accident, but instead caused by someone moving at high speed. Instead of trying to talk to Quicksilver, Goliath, again with his impulsive nature, attacks Quicksilver. Quicksilver makes pretty short work of most of the Avengers, but when he tries to take down Vision, the mass-changing android manages to stop Pietro utterly dead in his tracks. It's a very great comical moment, and I really love how Quicksilver goes just completely sprawling after he hits Vision. In some ways, it's very cartoony, and in others, it's rather visceral. I cringe at thinking how hard Quicksilver ran into Vision, only to be thrown back by so much force. And in the end, I'm really surprised at how coherent Quicksilver turns out to be, all things considered, between his exhaustion and his slamming into what is effectively a steel or concrete wall. I'm impressed at how well Quicksilver is able to deal with the Avengers, and although Quicksilver has worked out with most of the Avengers, certainly sparred with a lot of them, Captain America, Goliath, Goliath was using a different skill set when he was Hawkeye, and two of the members are new, so Quicksilver has some of the information and obviously the element of surprise, but I think it's impressive how much more he is able to deal with this threat, in part because he's an individual as opposed to a team, and coordination within a single individual vice coordination for a team is obviously much simpler, but it also demonstrates that his attacktives are effective against most individuals and are readily adaptable to different situations. Now, obviously, Quicksilver's problem comes in the fact that Vision doesn't really follow the normal physical rules that Quicksilver is counting on, and so when he slams into him like that, he expects a certain reaction and doesn't get it, and that's really how Quicksilver is taken down here. But as we see, cooler heads end up prevailing, and Quicksilver is able to explain to the Avengers that the reason for his haste and temperament is that Scarlet Witch is in dire peril, and that he has come to ask the aid of the Avengers in saving her. We know that there are very few things in the universe that matter as much to Quicksilver as his sister Scarlet Witch, so it explains a lot that he comes to the Avengers first for this help, especially considering that last time the Avengers had an interaction with Quicksilver, his loyalties were highly questionable at best. So Quicksilver's really going out on a limb here, coming to the Avengers, but he knows that they're the best people to help save Scarlet Witch. Quicksilver is also surprisingly non-confrontational in this situation, especially because he is known for being a bit of a hothead. He comes to the Avengers far more humble than I think we've seen him before, is at a point where he is almost begging the Avengers for their help. And in fact, it's the Avengers, really Goliath, who starts this fight in the first place. So Quicksilver kind of contains the situation, but he doesn't really escalate it further. And when he is disabled, he takes it and really, I don't say gives up, but concedes the fight to the Avengers. Quicksilver informs the Avengers that, having lost her Hex powers several months earlier, Scarlet Witch, Quicksilver, and Toad have been on a 
quest attempting to restore Wanda's powers. Unfortunately, it's been unsuccessful, and after scouring every library they could find, Toad suddenly remembers and suggests a cloister that he had forgotten about until that moment. And so they head off to investigate this really kind of last resort final source. I don't know if I'd call this a retcon, but last time we saw this particular trio, Scarlet Witch's powers weren't working, but it seemed to be more from a head injury she had suffered a couple of issues earlier, as opposed to her abilities just being gone. I feel as though she should have been able to naturally heal from the injuries and regained her powers. It's possible that she did heal and that the powers just didn't return, and that's why we're finding these three in this particular situation, but it seems a little more likely that things were tweaked a little bit from the previous story to kind of drive this particular storyline. I'm also a little surprised to see the siblings still hanging around with Toad, because generally speaking, Toad isn't very well liked, nor historically was he particularly kind to the siblings. Admittedly, this often has more to do with the influence of Magneto than anything else, but I still find it somewhat surprising that they would choose to associate themselves with Toad when they had a choice. It is, however, nice to see him adding to the group effort, because let's face it, normally Toad doesn't do anything but play a yes man, so the fact that he is able to contribute in a meaningful manner is kind of fun and different, and a nice little moment for Toad. So when the trio arrive at this cloister, they're greeted by an ancient looking figure who offers them access to the library, but warns them not to attempt any restorations of Scarlet Witch's powers without him present for fear that they might not be able to handle it alone. Now, after many, many hours of searching and just as they are about to abandon said search, Pietro accidentally discovers a hidden compartment with yet another book. The siblings feel like the book is calling to them. As Scarlet Witch opens it, the book itself is enchanted, turning pages all on its own and revealing a nameless spell. Of course, failing to heed the counsel of their host, Wanda reads the spell and inadvertently summons Archon the Magnificent. Now, I like how the story here plays on the reader's preconceptions with the old man. I immediately assumed that, based on his appearance, he was going to be some form of villainous figure, when in reality he is more or less harmless, if a touch creepy. He offers the party a lot, all things considered, and some really sage advice, which of course they promptly ignore at the first convenient moment. Because let's face it, a glowing magic book that opens itself to a particular page should be throwing up warning flags all over the place. But because it's comics and because the plot demands it, we just blaze past those warning signs at about 100 miles an hour. Now, the way Archon here is introduced, I originally assumed that he was somebody I should be aware of, but wasn't through some fault of my own. Instead, it turns out that he is just a creation for this issue, though from here, he's going to have a couple of dozen different appearances throughout the years. Archon himself is an odd sci-fi fantasy blending of archetypical characters. Really, he's part Conan, part John Carter, with a little bit of Zeus mixed in for good measure. Now, it is worth noting that while Marvel has published titles for both Conan and John Carter, the Conan book didn't premiere until October of 1970, and John Carter not until June of 1977. So it makes sense why Marvel would introduce a character like this, because obviously these are both popular popular characters and they would like to incorporate a character like this but at the time they weren't publishing either of the characters so they could kind of take bits and pieces and mix them together and throw this character into this Avengers story without worrying about bleeding over into their Conan or their John Carter titles. Almost immediately after arriving, Archon's gaze seizes upon Scarlet Witch, and he declares that she will be his mate. Obviously, this doesn't go over very well with the trio of mutants, and they attack Archon, but are hurled back, and Archon seemingly destroys Toad with a lightning bolt-shaped javelin, hence the little bit of Zeus mixed in there. Now, you gotta feel for Toad in this issue. He finally gets to be something more than a useless yes-man, and what does he get for his efforts? He gets blasted in to either another dimension or just plain disintegrated. And I have to say, Archon's words regarding Toad are particularly harsh, if not a bit true. Archon specifically says, he was already nothing, I merely made his form match his worth. 
Again, we started seeing Toad turn himself around, but based on history, Archon isn't strictly wrong. It's just difficult and, and kind of harsh to hear someone say it. Now, with his attackers subdued, Archon takes this opportunity to tell the Scarlet Witch that he has come from a parallel world where he is the magnificent ruler of the whole world, having earned this position by being the most powerful warrior in their brutal and martial society. So this is a great opportunity for us to stop in the middle of a fight and give a multi-page backstory monologue. Hooray! Now, honestly, I will say I have almost no complaints about this piece of the story because it's going to be a really fun mix of sword and sorcery and science fiction. But I had to laugh out loud because it is just so stereotypical that we're going to stop the fight for this multi-page monologue. This is literally the kind of thing that The Incredibles was parodying when they talk about villains monologuing this exact moment. He could have ended the fight, he could have just gone forward and done what he needed to do, but no, first he has to get up and deliver a speech. Now having said this, I really enjoy the visual that we're going to get from Archon's world, where it's filled with stereotypical barbarians in fur loincloths, but they're fighting with lasers and riding on these weird horse-dinosaur hybrids. It gives the reader a lot of cognitive dissonance, because these are just things that don't typically go together, but somehow I'm okay with it. It's almost as if it's so over-the-top ridiculous that it comes around full circle and is once again believable. Archon goes on to say that after he obtained power, he was visited by an elderly man who informs him of the pending doom of his planet. An energy ring that surrounds the world and provides it with light has begun to disintegrate. Soon we see that all life on the planet has begun to break down and even Archon is unable to stop the decay of his home. Then suddenly when all hope seems lost, light returns to their world. I want to comment that having been playing these games a lot lately, I have to say that the Elder advising Archon really reminds me of... Xehanort from Kingdom Hearts. He's just got that same facial shape, the same kind of pointy beard. Obviously, there's no relation there, but it, it is always interesting to see that kind of stereotypical look working its way through various media forms. I feel like the whole setup of this planet and its light source is really highly problematic and it's a little too weird to be reasonable or believable without at least a little bit more attempted explanation. I think we all recognize that whatever science the comic books are going to quote is usually garbage, but I think at times it's easier for the reader to accept things if they at least make an effort to explain a little bit. Now, with regard to the art, I find it really amazing how a subtle shift in the color palette and a change in body position of a character can change their situation so much. Archon goes from being a paragon of the human form in the prime of life to looking ghastly and gaunt and on the brink of death, really, again, by just changing the color palette and the way the character holds themselves. And I think it is excellently done and really really helps sell the reader on what is happening. I'm also really surprised to see the manner in which this society has fallen apart. I would assume that a violent warrior culture like this would have turned even further to barbarism and violence as resources become scarce. And instead, it really seems as though they have become highly passive, almost laying down and accepting their fate. Really what it does is subverts my expectations, which again, this story is already doing enough of that I find a lot of enjoyment in that. Sure, there's something to be said for watering down a, a well-trod path, a familiar path that's comforting and kind of inviting, but there's also something very thrilling about going down a path that you haven't gone down before or what you feel is that familiar path taking very unfamiliar twists and turns. Maybe you're taking a parallel path to the same destination, but the actual road to get there is different. It can be a very exciting and, and pleasurable experience, which is, I think, what this story does. Summoning the Elder again, Archon demands to know where this light came from. He soon learns that it has been generated by the energy from a nuclear blast on Earth, and that the light will only last for a year. The Elder, however, goes on to say that although the people of Earth use this weapon for war, they are quickly turning towards peace, which will once again endanger Archon's world. Seeking to prevent this, Archon is determined to travel to Earth so that he can 
properly place a nuclear blast of sufficient magnitude that it will provide light for generations to come. So I can't decide if the idea of nuclear blast providing this society with light is good or bad. On one hand, it's at least a positive outcome for nuclear weapons testing. On the other side, you have to set off all, like nuclear weapons f for the society to keep going, which, generally speaking, setting off nuclear bombs is bad. And with that in mind, while I'm not a fan of setting off a massive nuclear blast anywhere on the planet, the odds of setting off even a massive blast and it causing some kind of global catastrophe are actually pretty slim, at least in the manner that's being described here. Obviously, we've all heard the phrase nuclear winter, which effectively we cause a bit of an ice age on our own planet because we block out the sun with all the debris and things thrown into the atmosphere by nuclear war. But I think as we have kind of come to accept, you would have to have a lot of of nuclear blasts spread over a fairly wide area in order to achieve this. Archon determines that he is going to be unable to travel to Earth using his own power, and so he caused the book to appear to Scarlet Witch, leading her to read the required incantation, which brings Archon to Earth. Having finished his story finally, Archon uses one of his lightning bolts to transport Scarlet Witch to his home, and then quickly uses one on himself to follow suit. Now, Archon lays out some pretty specific conditions which were required to bridge between the two universes. And I feel like it's really pretty unlikely that he would have actually achieved them, even granting him a certain degree of manipulation, seeing how, especially at this point in the Marvel Universe, Scarlet Witch is really the only person who could have pulled this off, who fit into all of these conditions. Now, back in New York, Quicksilver finishes relaying everything that has happened to the Avengers. And while they are concerned, the Avengers feel that Quicksilver's story is a little bit unbelievable, at least until a news report comes on the television claiming that a man wielding lightning bolts has attacked a meeting of top international scientists. And this man who turns out to be Archon has singled out several top nuclear physicists and transported them away, leaving the rest of the world shocked and worried about what nuclear horrors are in store. Now, I do find it funny here at the end that the news anchor gives a rather specific report of what the guy looks like and what kind of weapons he's using, as if they were, I don't know, important to the plot. On the other hand, I suppose at this point in the Marvel Universe, this kind of thing isn't actually all that weird. You figure things have been going on for the better part of a decade here in the Marvel Universe, and they've just kind of gotten used to weird stuff. Overall, this isn't a bad issue, though when I finished it, it felt like it was only a portion of the issue and that it was incomplete. Now, obviously, this is the first part of a multi-issue arc and therefore by its definition is an incomplete story, but it's more than that. I think the logical place to end the issue would have been with Archon disappearing with Scarlet Witch. And so ending where it does, the issue feels like it started a new chapter just in time to to end the book. Also, the fact that the story contains a flashback within a flashback gives it an odd feeling that I think adds to that sense of incompleteness. Thankfully, though, it's an overall enjoyable story, and the return of a couple of beloved characters, specifically Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver, and some very strong art make up for this shortcoming in the story, this sense of unfulfillment. Now, before we go, I did want to touch for a moment on some of the big announcements from San Diego Comic-Con, which was this past weekend. In terms of Marvel actual comics, this was a very X-Men focused Comic-Con with the premiere of the Hickman X-Men series, plural, coming reasonably soon. So obviously they were very focused on that. But there were a lot of Marvel Phase 4 announcements because, you know, we've hit the end of, of Phase 3 here and we needed to kind of refresh into what was coming. So real quick, I just kind of want to go through these, a little bit of my thoughts and, and, and go from there. So First up is Black Widow coming out May 1st, 2020. I'm very excited for this one. I think it is overdue. Obviously, it's not really any fault of Marvel's or Scarlett Johansson's. It's really been a problem of trying to get schedules to mesh because Scarlett Johansson, being the star that she is, has been very busy and they have struggled to get everyone together. 
two things I'm excited most about this for is the fact that Taskmaster is going to be the primary villain and that we will finally get an explanation of what happened in Budapest. Next up is Falcon and the Winter Soldier coming out in fall of 2020 on Disney+. Plus. I'm looking forward to this because I think this is going to be an odd couple buddy cop kind of show. Maybe like a lethal weapon kind of kind of deal. You know, Falcon and Winter Soldier, there was a little bit of competition, but there's also a certain degree of camaraderie. Obviously, the fact that they're both friends of Captain America. I'm curious to see the dynamic between them now that Falcon has kind of taken over the mantle of Captain America. It'll be an interesting balance, but I think it will be a lot of fun. Next up is The Eternals. November 6th, 2020. I am, I'm going to say I am cautiously optimistic. It's got a pretty big name cast. Uh, Salma Hayek, whom I think is fantastic. Richard Madden and Angelina Jolie. I'm hit and miss on Angelina Jolie, but I think it's one of those things that so often we see big celebrities come into a film franchise like these especially comic book heroes, and we go, oh, they're going to be terrible, and it turns out they're really not. Think Heath Ledger, think Ben Affleck, right? There's a lot of potential here, so I'm not overly worried uh, about the Eternals. I don't have a whole lot of personal knowledge on the Eternals, so I'm definitely going to have to do some reading and, and figuring out, which is fine because it's good old-fashioned Jack Kirby fantastic comics. So next up is Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. This is not a new announcement, uh, like Eternals and Falcon and the Winter Soldier. We did get the, the subtitle, you know, Legend of the Ten Rings, which is something I'm excited for. Obviously, the Ten Rings is something that has been teased since the original Iron Man and then Iron Man 3 when we had the Mandarin. So it'll be fun to touch on this again and hopefully see it further fleshed out. In spring of 2021, we have WandaVision. Again, not a new announcement, but I am excited to see this title. We did get a little bit more information. It sounds like it's going to feature a, an adult version of Monica Rambeau. And I really just like these two characters together. Now, having said that, Next up is Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, which is May 7th, 2021. And not only is it going to feature Doctor Strange, but also Scarlet Witch, which given her comic book power set is a really great mix. Obviously, Scarlet Witch having magical powers. Again, I'm not a I'm not big on Doctor Strange, so I don't know where this story is going to go. But I like the name Multiverse of Madness. It sounds like it's going to be pretty freaking crazy, and so I'm looking forward to that. In spring of 2021 is the Disney Plus series Loki. It sounds like this story is going to pick up from Endgame, where the kind of alternate universe Loki makes off with the Tesseract. And we'll see where it goes from there. Tom Hiddleston has done a very good job with Loki. I don't quite understand the appeal of Tom Hiddleston, but he does a good job with the character. So I will certainly watch it and kind of see where it goes. In summer 2021, we are going to get Marvel What If. There are a lot of great old Marvel What If stories. One that sounds like we're already going to get is What If Peggy Carter became Captain America. Uh, I'm very excited because I love Haley Atwell and I love the character of Peggy Carter. I was very sad when Agent Carter got canceled. So I'm looking forward to seeing this. Plus, it's kind of an anthology series that I think is going to be a lot of fun. In fall of 2021, we are going to get a Hawkeye series where Jeremy Renner is going to be Clint Barton, but he's going to be working with a young protege, Kate Bishop. Up. So this is leading me to believe that maybe we are going to be start pushing towards the Young Avengers. You know, there have been rumors since Endgame that we're going to go into Secret Avengers, Dark Avengers, and Young Avengers. So I think this is at least leading us towards the Young Avengers, which is fine because those are also a lot of fun characters. And we'll, we'll, we'll see how those go. On November 5th, 2021, we have Thor Love and Thunder, which is a very odd title, I think, for a Thor film. This is going to be, once again, directed by Taika Waititi, who directed Ragnarok. I have a little bit of mixed feelings about this. I'm excited because I think, as much as I loved Ragnarok, that this combination is going to be really great. Yeah, Chris Hemsworth, Tessa Thompson, and... 
surprisingly, Natalie Portman will be rejoining the cast, reprising the role of Jane Foster. And the the real big reveal from Comic-Con was that she will be playing the female Thor uh, that we've had in the comics for the last couple of years. I'm really excited for that character to take the, the screen because I think the female Thor was great. Uh, haters can hate and deal with it, and I don't care because it was awesome. My only concern is that the last couple of films, Natalie Portman was re- was really phoning it in. Her heart was really just not in the role, and it was very, very obvious. Now, maybe it was because she was the love interest and she got tired of playing that very stereotypical role, but at the same time, maybe it wasn't, and also... Hey, you've been hired, you know, as an actor to do this role, you know, make an effort here. So I'm really excited about the character coming back and becoming the female Thor. Uh, I'm a little reserved on whether Natalie Portman is actually going to care or not. So we'll see what happens. Uh, The final confirmed big announcement is that Blade will be joining the Marvel Cinematic Universe and Blade will be played by Mahershala Ali, who is is best known for playing Cottonmouth in Daredevil. Fantastic actor. I really loved him in Daredevil. Um, And he will be playing Blade. There is no release date for this film yet, but I'm very excited. This should be a lot of fun. You know, the Wesley Snipes Blades, one, you know, really proved that kind of the modern comic book movie, especially Marvel comic book film, could could do something. But, you know, I think we're, we're past that. I can understand why Marvel chose not to go with Wesley Snipes. Oh, he was great for the character back then. Uh, I understand them wanting to bring in a somewhat younger actor. And to be fair, you know, Snipes has had his issues. He's done time in prison for tax evasion. So I can understand why Marvel doesn't necessarily want to make him a big part of their plans moving forward. Now, obviously, there are a lot of other films and things that w- that we know are kind of out there. There is a lot of talk about both a Fantastic Four and an X-Men film, both of those having come back into the fold with Disney's acquisition of Fox. Now, I think Marvel is, is doing the right thing by taking its time in developing these films and figuring out how to best make them fit as part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but I'm excited to see where they go from here. I will say, let's go ahead and move the X-Men away from Wolverine. I know he's a popular character, but you know we've had a lot of Wolverine on screen, and I think it's time that we focus on some of the other characters, and you know we can just let Wolverine be. Obviously, Black Panther two, Captain Marvel two, and Guardians of the Galaxy three are all films we know are out there. There really hasn't been much revealed about these three films. They will fit into the Marvel Cinematic Universe here at some point. I wouldn't be surprised to see Guardians 3 fit in prior to Thor uh, Love and Thunder, just because of the fact that Thor is off with the Guardians of the Galaxy right now. But beyond that, I don't have a whole lot of information. In general, though, uh, from an MCU standpoint, this is a very exciting San Diego Comic-Con. A lot of great announcements, some really fun surprises like the Jane Foster. And looking forward, the Marvel Cinematic Universe has a bright future for the next several years. So we shall see where things lead. Remember, you can find us at AvengersAssembly.com. You can follow this podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, and YouTube. Next week, we are going to be taking a look at Avengers number 76, The Blaze of Glory, The Flames of Love. All right, hey. All right, good job, guys. Let's just not come in tomorrow. Let's just take a day. Have you ever tried shawarma? There's a shawarma joint about two blocks from here. I don't know what it is, but I want to try it.